Charles, tell me, when did you know that music was going to be your life? Well, um, I was imitating uh, singers when I was 22 months old. I saw it in my baby book, and my mom would take me in the ice cream parlor, and the girls would put nickels in the jukebox, and I'd do it. And my first paying job was seven years old, imitating Elvis Presley. But if you go on Facebook, it's there, me with the guitar and the whole bit. And I supported myself in a band through high school um, and wrote, and th but I never thought of it as a career. I, I thought I was going to play football. I was a pretty good football player. I got hurt, and I came back, and I became very good friends with Joe Namath. And um, when he was rehearsing for the Flip Wilson show, it was in February, and Elvis Presley appeared in Vegas every February and August. And I had seen Elvis a few times, but uh, Joe said he was, you know, I was going to run over to Vegas from L.A., and see the show, and Joe made the arrangements for me, which I didn't know why, I said I, I could handle that. But Elvis um, gave the lady I was with a scarf and grabbed my hand and then told me somebody would take me backstage, and I spent uh, quite a, a number of hours with Elvis, which was a treat. I came back to Los Angeles, and Joe had finished the Flip Wilson rehearsal, and I met him at a restaurant called La Taverna on Sunset Boulevard. It was his attorney, who's still his good friend today, Jimmy Walsh, and this little strange gentleman at the end of the table who had a phone, there was no cordless phones even, and he was imitating Johnny Cash, and I said, Joe, that was really great. Elvis said hello, and, and the guy said, oh, you saw Elvis? What would you think about the backgrounds? And we get into this heavy musical conversation, and he said, what record label are you with? And I said, I'm not. I own Batch was three with, you know, that Joe used to be involved with. And Jimmy Walsh looks at the guy, he said, no, he's not kidding you. So the guy said to me, young man, I've never told this to anyone, but if you never thought about becoming a record producer, I suggest you do. And that gentleman's name was Phil Spector. Hmm. So when he told me that, I started taking it seriously, and uh, I knew that nothing would give me the fulfillment. Money wouldn't do it, nothing would do it, is that uh, this love of, of music. And I'm a fan. I've always admired great singers like Cuba. and uh, I'm, I'm really a fan of great songs and great singers. So I said, what better way? This is my true calling. And, and it's, I've never looked back since then. Fantastic. That's fantastic. All right, two more questions and we'll be done. Uh, next question, second last question is, besides yourself, who is your favorite songwriter? That is really tough. And it's tough not because I can name a, at least 10 or 15 writers that have had songs that have lasted forever. But personally, from a selfish point of view, there's a fellow named Rudy Clark that wrote Everybody Plays the Fool. Everybody Plays the Fool was the first song that I sang when I joined the main ingredient in 1970. It's still on the radio now. This is 2012. It has only been copied by one other singer, and that was Aaron Neville. And went to number one. And it went to one to, uh, uh, to number one. So what we did was we had created a song that everybody knows, everybody loves, that has heard it, but it hasn't been, I don't want to use the wrong word here, but it hasn't been maligned with people doing bad versions of it. There's a song that I did called Just Don't Want to Be Lonely. That was uh, written by Bobby Eli and uh, the lady's name, I can't remember. Linda Creed? Out of, yeah, Linda Creed out of Philadelphia, okay? That song was initially done by uh, uh, Ronnie Dyson, Isaac Hayes, a group called Blue Magic, and we just did it differently. We put a groove to it, kind of like this Christmas song I'm getting ready to sing. We have a groove and a pocket to it so people can move their heads and feel the melody and the beauty of it at the same time. Those are the kind of writers that work for me. When you turn around and look at Tommy Bell, you know he is nothing but the consummate writer. He, he took single-handedly a group called the Stylistics and made them household words in my lifetime. Now, I like um, uh, the guy who wrote the music for West Side Story. I can give my age away, it really doesn't matter. I like the fact that these guys know that. I like, um, oh God, um, he works Vegas all the time. Uh, um, well, it doesn't matter. The idea, the melody and the lyrics is the first thing for me. I don't have a favorite. It's like having a favorite baseball player, okay? Somebody is going to automatically say Jackie Robinson. 
if he's of that mindset. Someone else will say Mickey Mouse. We're in an art, creative art business, okay? And to have a favorite would mean that you don't think that you, if you have to start your career all over again, can get a hit record or successful production from an unknown. But Nothing could be further from the truth. Right. There are youngsters right now working in supermarkets that could probably write me uh, the next mega hit that I sing, but they're not in the bit. They haven't applied themselves to it as yet. But they probably have written songs. They're unknown writers. Charlie Rollin, I never thought of him as a writer until I heard a meant to be in love. But it came from his heart. It came from his spirit. And that spirit was transformed through his production, through my voice. So the word, you and me, you and I, meant to be in love. A simple statement that everybody says. But it's just how you say it. Everybody plays a fool, meant to be in love. These are songs that, and we got away from it in this industry for a long time. 20 years is a long time. I turned off the radio for 15 years. Not because there weren't talented people on the radio, but was nothing that moved me to make me, to, to, to apply what was being said and the music to soothe me. It's entertainment. It's supposed to make me feel good. That's boom, boom, boom. It's supposed to make me feel good. That's what Charlie Wallet does. That's why I'm with him after 15 years. Well, I'd, I'd like to start off with two, two people that I work with, uh, Jimmy George. Uh, who Another wrote, great writer. Uh, Stuff for Cuba, if you were mine. He wrote um, right. I'll Always Love You for Taylor Dane, just to see if it's Smokey Robinson, Love of My Life. I produce a lot of Jimmy's uh, work. Mm -hmm. Fabulous writer. The Steels Brothers, who wrote Could It Be I'm Falling in Love, produced by Tom Bell. Tom Bell and Linda Creed were classic writers. Gamble Huff, loved him, right at the top of my list. Michael Masser. Um, these are what, what I'd say my top of the, the pick, my top picks. Excellent. All right, gentlemen, last question. <clears throat> if you could give one line of advice to the writers that are out there now, what would you say? Be true to the melody and the lyric. First, if you're a writer, it doesn't mean that you're a producer. If you're a writer, right. it doesn't mean that you're an artist. Stick to a melody and a lyric. Mm -hmm. um, as a producer, I have written maybe 20% of the stuff I produce. Because I have to feel it. And I'll take a great song from anybody. Uh, and my advice to a writer would be, do not contrive anything. Don't try to say, you know what, I'm going to put this in because it sounds like so-and-so and it's slick. Right. Feel it. Be it. Embody it. And let it come out. <clears throat> Don't contrive it. Write from your heart. Um, Tom Bell told me that if, if you go, if you write about love, you're either going to it or coming from it. And I said, yeah, but you're also in it. So any one of those three categories, you're going to hit a pocket of people and you're going to touch emotions and you're going to, you're going to heal. That's what I try to do with my songs, heal, whether I write it or not, songs that I produce. And uh, one of the first times I spoke to a group of young up-and-coming writers and music people, I told them about the three categories that you're either in love, going to it or coming from it. And I said, gentlemen, don't be in all three categories at the same time. It's too expensive. So that's my <laughs> advice to uh, up-and-coming writers. Fantastic. That concludes our show for today. Thank you, gentlemen. For Thank, you for Thank, Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Dave. Our pleasure to be here. Outstanding. Yeah. I'll let you all later. So, yeah, that was my interview with those guys, and it was completely awesome. I mean, they are like giants. They're legends in the music industry. So I'll put some links underneath the vid so you can check out. Cuba Gooding Sr. and Charles Wallert and most of the songwriters that we talked about as well. So you know my motto. Never stop writing. Deuces. Blase blue da blue da bleep blop blue.